My name is Vicki Tagalakis. I'm Division Director of General Internal Medicine at McGill University, Montreal, Canada, and I am a thrombosis physician specialist. I specialize in the treatment and management of thrombotic disorders. Case study, anticoagulation and renal failure. Mr. G is a 68-year-old man, retired postal worker. He developed a persistent cough with chest congestion and fever. The family physician ordered a chest x-ray, which confirmed pneumonia. Azithromycin was prescribed, but two days later, symptoms worsened with increasing shortness of breath and confusion. He was brought to the emergency room, where he was diagnosed with pneumonia, and his severity index was class 4. Broad-spectrum antibiotics were started. The patient demonstrated increased work of breathing throughout the next hour and became hypoxic with high flow oxygen mass. The patient was therefore re-evaluated and intubated and admitted to the intensive care unit. He's a, Mr. G, on further history, uh, has, is a moderate heavy smoker. His BMI is 32 kilos per meter squared. He has type 2 diabetes not optimally controlled and he has moderate renal insufficiency with a baseline cramp clearance of 50 mils per minute. Relevant laboratory show a CBC with a hemoglobin of 111, platelets 250, and a white count of 24, and now his cramp clearance is 33 mils per minute, which is a lot less than his baseline. Do you provide VT prophylaxis for Mr. G, who is now admitted to the intensive care unit with a CRAN clearance of 33 mils per minute. So Mr. G has several risk factors, both for venous thromboembolism and bleeding. Almost all medical ICU patients are at a moderate to high risk for venous thromboembolism. Uh, and so some form of thromboprophylaxis should be initiated in most. His risk factors include being in the ICU, immobilized, respiratory failure, obesity, intubation, and renal insufficiency have all been shown to increase risk of thrombosis. As well, renal insufficiency and critical care unit status are also risk factors for major bleeding for Mr. G. So you decide that Mr. G requires prophylaxis. Which type of anticoagulant will you use for prophylaxis? And your options include a direct oral anticoagulant, low molecular weight heparin, or unfractionated heparin. So thromboprophylaxis in the intensive care unit um, is, a, is especially a, a, an issue uh, because it is a, a special population, both for its high risk of thrombosis and its high risk of major bleeding. But low molecular weight heparin and unfractionated heparin are the standard of care for prophylaxis in the intensive care units. Although there is no difference between unfractionated heparin and low molecular weight heparin prophylaxis in ICU patients with respect to bleeding and VTE recurrence, the risk of heparin-induced thrombocytopenia is higher with unfractionated heparin. Therefore, most suggest the use of low molecular weight heparin for ICU patients uh, regarding prophylaxis. Currently, there is no data on direct oral anticoagulant use for thromboprophylaxis in ICU patients. If we return to the case, uh, how does the fact that the patient have a CRAN clearance of 33 mils per minute affect management? Well, patients with chronic kidney disease are at increased risk for thromboembolism and bleeding. Incremental decreases in renal function increase both venous thromboembolism and bleeding risk. The highest risk for fatal pulmonary embolism and bleeding events occur with GFRs less than 30 mls per minute. The risk of bleeding is increased up to twofold if the estimated GFR falls below 30 mls per minute. Increased thrombosis risk is thought secondary to chronic activation of the coagulation cascade coagulation and platelet activation occurring with the extracorporeal hemodialysis device as well. Bleeding risk is increased due to platelet dysfunction and altered platelet vessel wall interaction. In patients receiving dialysis, widespread heparin use and the need for frequent large vessel intervention is also, um, or manipulation is also another risk for bleeding. 
High prevalent use of medications in this population, such as aspirin or warfarin, can also be associated with bleeding. Clearly, the occurrence of kidney dysfunction in patients with venous thromboembolism uh, puts that patient at a higher risk of fatal PE and fatal bleeding. And there are certain factors that uh, are at a put that patient at a higher risk, uh, such as the development of cramp clearances, for example, less than 30 mils per minute. The odds ratio for fatal PE is 5.2. Uh, and, and when you compare to patients with a cran clearance of greater than 30 mils per minute. Immobilization in these patients is also associated with a 2.4-fold increased risk of bleeding versus no immobilization. The occurrence of cancer, for example, in these patients also increases the risk of fatal PE. Uh, when looking at fatal bleeding, we see that also cancer increases uh, the risk of fatal bleeding by 2.7-fold in these patients. These are patients with venous thromboembolism and, as well, kidney dysfunction. Uh, and similarly, there is an incremental increase in uh, fatal bleeding as your creatinine clearance or your GFR drops. So let's look at some studies that have looked at the usage of low molecular weight heparin in the ICU patient population. The direct study looked at delta parent in severe kidney dysfunction. Uh, this was a multi-center, single-arm trial in critically ill patients, uh, only 138 ICU patients, but they all had cran clearances less than 30 mils per minute, and in fact, almost 10% were on dialysis, and daltoparin was used at 5,000 international units of Q daily for a median of seven days. And it was noted that uh, although anti-10A levels, trough levels, uh, were less than 0.4 units per mil. There was no evidence of bioaccumulation as a result. All the trough levels were low. And uh, when we looked at the occurrence of outcomes, clinical outcomes, at seven days, uh, the DVT uh, rate was 5.1%, major bleeding was 7.2%, and some risk factors that were noted to increase the risk of major bleeding was a high aspirin, a uh, uh, higher use more use of aspirin and a higher INR. So the authors concluded that DVT prophylaxis with daltoparin is not associated with an excess anticoagulant effect due to drug uh, bioaccumulation. The direct study led to the PROTECT study. The PROTECT study was a large undertaking. It was a multi-center study in Canada that looked at over 3,600 patients comparing low molecular weight heparin, daltoparin, with unfractionated heparin and critically ill patients, including patients with renal failure and even patients with end-stage renal disease on hemodialysis. And what this study showed was that daltoparin compared to uh, unfractionated heparin reduced clinical pulmonary embolism. It was used safely in patients over a full range of renal function. It caused, most importantly, less heparin-induced thrombocytopenia five cases versus 12 cases in the unfractionated heparin group. It was administered once daily, uh, and it did not increase bleeding when compared to unfractionated heparin. When we look at specifically major bleeding, uh, you can see that uh, when comparing daltoparin to unfractionated heparin, there was no difference between the two. And moreover, when looking, however, at other serious adverse events, specifically heparin-induced thrombocytopenia, uh, we note that when we look at per-protocol analysis, meaning patients who actually uh, took uh, the drug, randomized, and in fact took daltoparin or infractionated heparin, there was a lot less heparin-induced thrombocytopenia in the daltoparin group. So low molecular weight heparin for prophylaxis, um, uh, we know that for daltoparin, it does not bioaccumulate at prophylactic doses. For anoxaparin, there may be some bioaccumulation requiring dose reduction as per the product chronograph. However, both are effective for prevention of venous thromboembolism across the full range of renal function, and both can be used in the ICU setting uh, for uh, thromboprophylaxis in patients with renal failure. So Mr. G, uh, back to our case, Mr. G uh, was treated for severe pneumosepsis and was thromboprophylaxed with low molecular weight heparin while in the intensive care unit. He fully recovered and was discharged home two weeks later. 
Fifteen days later, he presents to the emergency department with a swollen, painful left leg. The well score uh, is applied for a pretest probability of DVT, and it is moderate. A D-dimer is elevated, and so a Doppler ultrasound is done, which confirms the DVT of the femoral vein. It's noted that Mr. G has a deep carotid clearance of around 35 mils per minute, which is around his baseline. What would you do next? Which anticoagulant will you use for Mr. G? Uh, option A, direct oral anticoagulant, option B, low molecular weight heparin, or option C, a warfarin. Well, let's look at the specifics. So Mr. G has had a provoked deep vein thrombosis. Uh, this was following his immobilization in the ICU care setting. His risk factors for his thrombosis was hospitalization, the immobilization, and being in the ICU. So we know that he needs a treatment uh, of three months total duration because this was a majorly provoked deep vein thrombosis. However, the renal failure is an issue which limits the choice of anticoagulation. A very few patients with a CKD or severe renal failure were included in the atrial fibrillation and VTE DOAC trials. And when we look at the special population of patients with uh, renal dysfunction, and when we look at the phase three randomized trials of DOACs uh, for doxaban, apixaban, rivaroxaban, and dabigatran, uh, we see that uh, at the far right column that there were fewer patients with estimated cran clearances between 30 to 50 mils per minute. Uh, so around 245 patients um, for, uh, in the VT study uh, versus in the total study, 5,000. Uh, similarly, 18,000 patients were included in the PE study. Uh, but amongst those, only 3,500 had cranial clearances of 30 to 50. So this uh, table essentially shows you that we don't have uh, a lot of numbers of patients with cranial clearances of 30 to 50 that were included in the large trials of uh, VTE. Um, and, and so it may make it difficult to be able to apply this information or data that comes out of these studies to our patients. If we sum up the data from the major AFib trials and VT trials, and we look at patients with uh, chronic kidney disease with chronic clearances between 30 and 50 mils per minute, comparing the direct oral anticoagulants or, uh, uh, versus vitamin K antagonists, uh, when we look at the AFib trials and look at stroke and systemic thromboembolism, uh, uh, there is no significant difference in efficacy uh, between uh, the DOAC and vitamin K in these patients uh, uh, with chronic kidney disease. And when we look at summarizing the data from the DVT uh, and PE trials, uh, specifically in patients with uh, chronic clearances between 30 and 50 mils per minute, we also see that there's no significant difference between patients using a DOAC versus vitamin K antagonist in this of patient population, suggesting that the DOACs are equally as efficacious and as safe as vitamin K in patients with chronic clearances around 30 to 50 mils per minute. So um, the treatment of VT in, in severe chronic kidney disease, um, here we have listed the DOAC product monographs and the recommendations that the various uh, product monographs have put forth. And you can see here for rivaroxaban, uh, we can also see it for apixaban, edoxaban, and dabicatron. Uh, and according to the Cranton clearance, uh, the, uh, there are specific dosing recommendations that are made. So if we look specifically at Mr. G, uh, we note that he has the possibility of deterioration of renal function as his current Cranton clearance is 33 mils per minute which is below his pre-hospitalization current clearance of 50 mils per minute. So what are the options? Option one is to use low molecular weight heparin lead-in uh, concomitantly with warfarin and then uh, instituting uh, monotherapy with warfarin once INR uh, is therapeutic in the range of two to three. Another option is to proceed with a pixaban 
uh, 10 milligrams twice a day for seven days, followed by five milligrams twice a day, with a repeat creatinine clearance assessment at around one to two weeks thereafter to ensure that Mr. G's renal function is stable and not further declining. Uh, another option is to use rivaroxaban, 15 milligrams twice a day for three weeks, followed by uh, 20 milligrams once a day, and there again, we would want to ensure that uh, Mr. G's renal function remains stable or in fact is getting better. And in order to do this, we would have to do a blood testing in around seven to 14 days after starting rivaroxaban. Finally, we can also use edoxaban. Uh, the interesting thing here is that unlike the other two direct oral anticoagulants of apixaban and rivaroxaban, edoxaban does require a five-day lead-in uh, with low molecular weight heparin. Uh, so there would have to be some teaching of your patient as to how to inject low molecular weight heparin, similar to option one, uh, where warfarin is being used. Uh, and thereafter, uh, the five days of low molecular weight heparin, uh, we could use a dose reduction to 30 milligrams of edoxaban daily, and it's a dose, as we mentioned earlier, that has been approved and studied uh, for the treatment of ET in those patients with creatinine clearances that are decreased, such as Mr. G. Uh, I should also mention now that uh, for patients with creatinine clearances less than 30 mils per minute, DOACs are not the ideal choice. They're not the best option. Um, given the paucity of data that we have from clinical trials uh, with the use of these agents in severe or advanced renal dysfunction. However, if one chooses a DOAG for these individuals, then uh, prudent and careful monitoring for bioaccumulation should be performed uh, and access to uh, DOAG-specific anti-10A level monitoring uh, would need to be procured uh, in order to do this. Finally, I should mention on this slide that uh, a dabigatron for Mr. G is not really an option since for his range of creatinine clearance of between 30 and 50 mils per minute, the reduced dose of 110 milligrams has not been uh, studied in the management of VT. This concludes the presentation. Thank you for your time.